Let's face it, B2B sales is in trouble. Blast emails, cold calling and irrelevant messages, not to mention an economy causing uncertainty to spike, is creating a canyon-sized divide between buyers and sellers alike. The answer? Deep sales. Today, organisations that adopt deep sales strategies and technologies are setting themselves up for long-term success with an approach that sets their sellers up to be seen as trusted, strategic advisors by the buyers they serve. We at the world's largest professional network are sitting down with some of the most innovative sales voices today to discuss what it means to bring deep sales into an enterprise organisation. Let's dive in with our host, Rob Humphrey. On this episode of the Deep Sales Podcast, I am stoked. I've got Jordan Lee. He's a partner at Bain & Company. He used to be a software engineer at Electronic Arts, and he got his MBA from MIT. Super smart guy with an amazing perspective on generative AI and sales, deep sales, and sales playbooks. Welcome, Jordan Lee. Look, I appreciate you joining the Deep Sales Podcast. This is, uh, we're, we're so psyched to get you that you have done a bunch of dope stuff. But before we get started, hit me with something that's not on your LinkedIn profile. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, a little embarrassing, maybe, but back in the late 90s, early 2000s, I uh, was uh, living with my parents back then and uh, set up a uh, my first attempt and made my last attempt at entrepreneurship and and started a little internet radio station. And, uh, and so nice. I'm sort of, uh, um, awestruck to be here with, with you because this is what I started doing, I don't know, over 20 years ago. Uh, it went nowhere. I think maybe we had at most a hundred listeners back then. This was pre Spotify days or anything like yeah. that, but it was my first, first venture into the world of audio streaming at the time. Nice, nice. Did you do, did you do like a show or what? What did you work on? It, w- it was a little bit of music, but mostly it was around video games. And so back then, um, I was a gamer back then, growing up, and we had this idea that maybe people would want to, just like we had sportscasters on AM radio back then and still do today, maybe folks would want to do that with with video games. And so we had a bunch of, uh, I don't know what we called them. They were like video game casters, uh, pre yeah. Twitch. This was all just audio. Yeah. Well, so, well, now it's like a career now. It's like a, yeah, a full-fledged now, now career. That's a big thing. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but back then, so that's what we did. And so we had folks that would sit there. They, they'd join uh, games, and then they'd sort of stream or, or sportscast it. And then we had folks listening in because this was before you could actually see it as an, uh, as yeah. a, as a, as a, as an audience member. So, yeah, so yeah. what was your... Uh... I'm assuming you played console games. What was your game of choice back in, in your... I your PC games back then. So okay. Was, okay. Um, so back then, what was it? I think the, the multiplayer games that were getting popular then was around like called Team Fortress. Sure. It was built off of the Quake engine and then eventually became Counter-Strike and um, and, and so on and so forth. So that, that was what nice. folks were trying to, trying to listen to. So that's what we were doing for a little bit. Very cool, man. I appreciate you sharing that, Jordan. So look, you... You're at Bain. You're a partner at Bain and company, uh, obviously super prestigious consulting company. Uh, You've been there 13 years-ish, but before that, you worked as a software engineer in the game industry at Electronic Arts. I'm kind of curious, like, how did that sort of, like, you know, inform your career? Or what did you learn about video games that you apply to this this role you have today? Yeah, well, video games is is a lot of fun. And maybe that's the biggest thing that I took away is, Look, um, very few of us are actually in life or death situations. And so you remember to have fun all the time. I think the other thing that I picked up being a software engineer is you're you're one of many, many software engineers that are trying to crank out a game and and get it out the door. And and so it's a it's a massively team sport. Yeah. And and uh, that's true kind of wherever you are. It's it's especially true in what I do in, in consulting is we're, we're never going and working on a client project solo. There's there's often a a team that's working with us and everyone has to play their role and and we all have to have fun doing it together. We're often cramped in a small conference room or sitting up sitting on planes many times in airports. And so it's just super important to just continue to have fun every day with your team and then work as a team. And it's yeah. uh, it's never about you really. It really never is. Yeah, no, it's refreshing to hear that. I'm I'm with you on that. It's like you gotta 
you got to do work and have fun. Uh, you got to do both of those things. So absolutely. Speak, speaking of work, so I've read everything you've done. You've done a lot of stuff. You've been on a lot of uh, shows. You've done some podcasts. You also uh, co-wrote an article fairly recently in the Harvard Business Review. You talked about sales plays. You described this as these coordinated like set of actions um, that create these, you know, up-leveled opportunities to win. Tell me a little bit about that approach, um, that sort of uh, sales plays approach, and maybe share an example if you have one. Yeah. So um, this this whole concept, I mean, sales plays isn't isn't new to the industry. Uh, many of us use sales plays. It, it's sort of what we do. You know, I think one of the things that that my colleagues and I discovered over the years was um, one of the hardest things to do for a company at any so- sort of scale um, is staying coordinated. And you know, you, you look at you look at startups, and the, the first sales rep is basically the CEO. Mm-hmm. You know, and then maybe they add a, a, a sales engineer at some point and they add more sales reps. And it's not hard to stay coordinated because it's it's you. Yeah. But as you get to 100 reps, 1,000 reps, whatever it is, the piece that starts to break down is the coordination be- between all the various folks in the selling team and outside the selling team. Right. Sales coordinating with marketing, sales coordinating with commercial operations, sales coordinating within sales to get the right SC, the right specialist as well get the CSMs there. And so that's the idea behind sales plays or sales and marketing plays is getting everyone coordinated around a common mission. And then when you get everyone marching in the same direction, it turns out each individual player wants to be as productive as possible. And when you get everyone marching in the same direction, it gets much easier. And so a lot of our clients actually feel this too. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's not hard. Um, but it is difficult to get everyone executed together. And so we've worked with, worked with clients, especially those that have, you know, they've grown to the scale where they have multiple products. And so one of our technology clients, you know, ha- has a portfolio that is dozens of products large now, um, and, and sort of, you know, r- roughly 10 specialists or so, or specialist types. And so getting the whole selling team coordinated around a common mission, what product to sell at the right time to which customer and in what sales cadence, because incredibly important just to make sure that everyone is not tripping each other in front of the customer or in preparation to go see the customer. Yeah, for sure. So we appreciate you sharing. Look, like one of the biggest things that's occurred that's got to impact your playbook, and I'm curious about your reaction to this, is, you know, we had this whole, you know, pandemic scenario right so all of a sudden we were not like in front of clients as much right and even today it's sort of still sort of hybrid i mean as a sales rep myself i'm like let me travel like i can't wait to travel right and see people um how is the playbook so to speak you know how's that changed um over the last couple years for you all yeah so i i think um look covid actually it taught us a lot of new tricks Right. And, and, and it robbed from us a lot of the things that, that, uh, we would normally like to do. I mean, losing the in-person touch was a, was a big challenge that a lot of folks had to overcome, you know, the, the, the challenge of just not only just the, the customer to rep interactions, but just how to prep as a team ahead of a, ahead of a meeting, right. The organic nature, it's harder to do flybys, all that kind of stuff. Um, but what it did teach us was, boy, we can, we can actually still be productive without having to travel as much. Uh, it becomes much easier to bring in folks who probably couldn't have made it to the meeting or wasn't actually worthwhile to fly five hours to take a 30 minute meeting with a customer, but now you can just bring them in on video conference. Right. And so that's enabled a, a whole, um, improvement, I would say in our ability to bring in the right people at the right time. We certainly feel this in our business, right? V- very often. Uh, the right expert isn't exact in the exact city where where the client is, yeah. and so our ability to bring in somebody who is in Europe, time zone permitting, or in Asia, right, is much easier, and it's a better experience for for our clients. Is they get the right expert globally that can come in and help them with their topic, and it's not constrained by just the ability of space and time to get people to fly in. Yeah. It's uh, it's interesting. I think the, you're 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 very optimistic about the upside of you know availability of people, um, but we'll, we'll, I think we'll circle back to that in a little bit. So, look, we talk about uh, at LinkedIn this concept of deep sales. Are you familiar with this at all? Yeah, yeah. Uh, good. 
generally characterizes like two things. One, rethinking the sales process, viewing the relationship between the seller and the buyer as sort of the foundation, not the outcome of the sale. And two, like scaling uh, the organization um, uh, across the organization, the best practices for top sellers. I'm particularly interested in obviously leveraging technology, your take on this approach. And in particular, you know, what do you see set your organization and your client organizations? Like, what are they doing to sort of up-level the performance curve, like across the board? Yeah. I mean, one of my fundamental beliefs is every, every rep um, can be a very productive rep and they're, they're intrinsically motivated to be as productive as possible. Right. And so yeah, um, they want to get paid, right. They want to get paid. Totally. And, and, and I think oftentimes though, we as organizations frankly make reps lives pretty difficult and and it's sort of they want to be as productive in spite of all the things that we put yeah. in front yeah. of them right and yeah. so yeah like i think the best organizations um are thinking about that and how do you then go enable reps to be as productive as possible right and so you know th there are things that every rep has to go do they have to go fill out you know, their sales methodology, they have to go load the opportunity into their CRM, you know, they have to fill out trip reports and account plans and all that kind of stuff. And yes, that, that, that does actually, that is important. They need to go do that. Um, but at the same time, we, we throw a lot of other stuff at them and, and, and the best organizations are systematically going through and saying, how do I actually free up the time for the rep? Simplify the forms as much as possible simplify the account planning requirements. Everyone needs to do an account plan, but make it as simple as possible. Make it as automated as possible to get the right data in so they're not actually having to fill it out over and over and over. That to me is critical. I think the other thing that that that, that top organizations are doing is they focus on the B players. And so, you know, you've got A players, B players, and C players. And I think sometimes it's very tempting for us to over-rotate to the A players. Why? Because are the ones that are producing. We give them the biggest opportunities, the hardest opportunities. We spend the most time with them as managers and coaches because we enjoy it, enjoy it. And and yet they're the people who need the less least amount of support. They've already yeah. figured out how to work around your systems or our systems in spite of everything we throw at them and they, yeah. and they figure out how to be productive. Let them keep doing that. Yeah. It's the B players who, by the way, are, you know, whatever, 70, 80% of your organization that are the ones that could be A players, but they need the help to get there. And so that's where getting L&D or learning enablement, get, getting them invested in helping the B players become A players. And that's also the whole sales play concept is your A players don't need to learn or relearn how to go do a pitch and what's the right sales cadence. They got it. It's your B players that need to learn from the A players to so bottle that up get into something and then, and, and then, and then get your B players up into A players. And that's where you go from, you can really supercharge the performance of the whole sales force. So is that like uh, dependent on, you know, managers or is there other coaching schemes or like, you know, how do you do that at scale? How do you actually like, uh, you know, uh, you know, get these people up to the next level? Yeah. The frontline managers where you went at are, are where, you know, we think they're the most important, right? You could put together as many training programs as you want, and those are important and required, but you have to get the frontline managers because they're the ones spending the most time with the reps, right? And so during those important weekly one-on-one -on -one calls, hopefully they're weekly, uh, <laughs> hopefully they're more than just inspecting yeah. pipe, right? But they're yeah, actually yeah. in there and, and, and helping them with, you know, how do you mature this opportunity? They're asking the questions of the rep to get them to think about the right things, right? That's super important. And we tend to under club there, right? I mean, most of our frontline managers got there because they were really good reps, but not necessarily great managers. They can probably get there, but you also have to teach your managers, your frontline managers, how to be a good coach, yeah. be a good manager, how to be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So now I appreciate you sharing, like, you know, the, the top performer thing is pretty interesting. You know, there's, there's definitely some habits that we've, we've looked at, um, that really separate sort of the top people from, you know, the A players from the B players, if you will. Uh, the first one, the first habit is top performers, you know, they focus on the accounts with the most white space, right? So they're always prioritizing high potential accounts. Are you seeing this in both your organization and clients? And are people practicing this habit today? We love this. And this whole idea of white space is super important. 
right? And and it's one of the things that we spend a lot of time with our clients with is how do you actually bring data to bear that helps your reps know where the white space is? Because the truth of the matter is, you know, the, the way that most most of us try and estimate white space is we just ask our reps, how much white space do you think is there? <laughs> And, yeah. you know, their pattern recognition is what is available to them, which is maybe however many accounts that they have. Yeah. Um, and, and what that obviously misses is the opportunity to have the pattern recognition across the entire account universe that a company covers, or even just across the install base that the company covers, let alone the account universe. And so, you know, we have this concept called the money map. And, okay. the, and the money map is basically takes the total addressable market, which we can often estimate at the macro level, but drills down to an individual account level and say, how much does that account have in their wallet and how much are we capturing, right? And and sort of tries to take the guesswork out of it. And rather than asking every single rep, how much head, headroom do you have in there? Which by the way, they kind of know when you're asking them, it's going to feed, feed into their quota. So they're always yeah. kind of, eh, it's not, it's not so much, right? And yeah, so, it's going to be, it's going to be, flat maybe be down it's probably yeah, gonna be exactly down. god it's gonna be so hard i don't even know if i'm gonna get the renewal this time so you know we should really temper our expectations but takes the guesswork out and and brings yeah. them data to bear right yeah. and then so you do it across the entire entire account universe by the way this helps your prospecting this helps your install base um and there's just so much data that's now available and this is the other thing sort of that's there's been an explosion of data in the world of B2B sales. And I'd say, yeah. you know, B2B sales has gone from this like voodoo black arts, you know, dark arts kind of thing yeah. where it's all intuition based. And now there's a ton of data that we can use to actually get much more insights around the account universe and what we think the real opportunity is. Um, and then of course the hard part is making sure that everyone buys in. And so there's a big sort of change management piece of it to make sure that Everyone from the rep to the manager to the territory planners to the quota design, quote, quota planners are using that data to inform the go to market and selling activities. The quota planners, I do a little activity. I've been at LinkedIn 13 years selling and I do a little activity called what, what's your favorite drink? And I, I make sure I send those MBAs and those quota sellers nice, you know, nice bottle of bourbon or whatever they're into. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit old school. So this brings us to the second habit of top performers, which is using a, a data to identify buyers. So, you know, buyer intent data. I mean, here at LinkedIn, obviously, like, I don't know, you know, I, I'd have to have LinkedIn sales navigator if I move on here because I have so much information in front of me. Like, um, it's crazy. But how do you see, you know, people employing buyer intent data? And, you know, do you see top performers or the sales org in general using buyer intent data. And, you know, some people are like, I don't need that, but like, that's a huge deal right now. So how, how are you using buyer intent data or just data in the sales process, uh, both organizationally and just across the board? Yeah. I mean, what, what, what we're seeing here is data is at the foundation of all of us. Um, and so everyone needs it, right? Commercial operations and sales ops needs it. The seller needs it. Your marketers need it. I, I think right now there's sort of a wealth of data that's available to folks. And the real trick is who's able to actually parse through that data for data's sake is, a, is, is can be a productivity drain. But if you're able to be really sharp around the data that the rep, that the marketer, that the commercial ops team actually needs and serve it up to them in a way that's actually useful and easy to navigate. Uh, even better if it automatically triggers workflows, right? Even better if if the intent data that my customer, Mr. Mr. So and so so and so is searching for this topic, it happens to be a good trigger for this sales play that I need to be running. Marketing gets that same intent, so they they launch ABM automatically. The sales rep is is knows that this is something of interest, and then they queue up a call to that to that potential buyer, yeah. right? The more automated it is, the better. At some point, you know, you get to the point where it's fully automated and there's things just flying out left, right, and center, and the rep is sort of being in their cockpit managing and seeing what's happening, but they don't need to trigger yeah. even better. Yeah. Right. Now, the other thing Agreed. I'd say is A player is already doing this. Your your top sales reps are probably out there already doing it. And so it's about seeing what they're using, or one way to do it, see what they're using and figure out how to bottle that up, get the right agreements in place, and then get it out to the whole sales force so they can all use it. Yeah, for 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 sure. I, it's it's an interesting topic. One of the the biggest topics, of course, is 
you know, generative AI. And I know you've been posting a lot about this. Uh, I wanted to hit you up with this. Like, do you think, how do you think, I mean, obviously it's going to, it is impacting sales, but how do you think AI is going to impact sales? And, and also like if you're a sales leader right now and you haven't implemented an AI strategy, are you, are you behind the eight ball? Yeah, I, I don't think it's possible to be behind because I don't think anyone's ahead on this front just yet. Okay. Uh, it's interesting. Not only six months ago, I, I was I was saying, gosh, it's so great that digital has finally hit B2B sales. And then six months yeah. later, it's like digital's in the rear view mirror. Already. We're way past digital now. It's Gen AI's yeah. it hitting us. I, I think there's huge potential, just just like in all, almost almost all all areas that we're seeing now that generative AI can be changing the world of B2B sales, but I think it's largely unproven as well. And so I think, you know, a lot of us are going to have to be dabbling in and experimenting to see what's working. Now, the good news is here, I think for a lot of us is, you know, because of what's happened with the release of chat GPT, uh, it's now part of the common parlance. And so uh, this is now something that is much easier to experiment with with customers because they already know what it is, right? Um, but we're going to figure out the right use cases. Is it going to be confined to the call centers? Is it going to be something that um, is going to help inform sales plays real time? Are we all going to have agents sitting in on our sales calls or sitting in our pocket listening in and feeding? Or who knows what it's going to be? The big question for everyone is what use cases are you exploring? How are you prioritizing? There's no shortage of, of ideas out there. And you have the right way to prioritize and start experimenting and start executing some of these. Um, and if not, you should be, right? And so I don't think anyone is behind yet, but this this is going to be a really interesting time of experimentation in our industry. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, of course, the other sort of big, you know, macro issue, and I think you've talked about this in a recent webinar uh, that you led on selling in a recession. I don't really like to use that word a lot, but you know, in a downturn, you know, how are companies going to go ahead and get market share? You know, what what's your advice to sales leaders uh, listening to this podcast about like how to come out stronger uh, post downturn? Yeah, well, as always, I mean, this is true in a downturn or in the, or in up cycles. <clears throat> stay close to your customers, right? Whether they're your install base or your prospects. I mean, the most important thing is continue to stay outward facing. Um, it's very easy to get sucked into the woe is me, all my dashboards are flashing red and you know, what do we do? Uh, flog the sales reps harder, flog marketing harder, everyone get yeah, work hard. But most importantly, it's stay close to your customers. Um, uh, make sure you understand what 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 they need. You know, one one of my one of my colleagues, um, you know, he was uh uh, a sales leader of, of a large technology sales force and, and recently retired. And, and he would share this story that actually was in downturns where he had his most productive years, uh, not productive in terms of top line, but productive in terms of number of buyers that came, that came in. Um, and those buyers, they started small, but, but he was able to, you know, create opportunities to break in. And those buyers ended up in, in the following years becoming a pretty meaningful contribution. And so, you know, I think there's there's huge opportunity in, in downturns to try and do something different here. The other thing I'd say though is um, a downturn is a great op great chance to actually focus on how do you make your reps more productive, right? And you know when when times are good, you're going out there and you're catching deals and you're closing deals and all that kind of stuff, and you don't really have time to spend figuring out how do we go free up ten more hours out of my reps week. Um, and so you know we think winners are actually ones that are differentially investing in improving the productivity of their sales force. Not naive, by the way, also the markets are demanding it, but you know, now's a great time to be doing that investing in, in overall productivity, helping your reps be as productive as possible, as efficient as possible in what they're doing, feeding them the right data, giving them the right third party tools or, or in-house tools to go do that. Yeah, for sure. So how do, how do you, how do you get closer to your customers? I and mean, what, what tactically do you, What's different in your playbook um, that you're willing to share? Yeah, so one of the things we, we've, um, we've 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 uh, been looking at is the whole the role of marketing in here. Yeah, uh, it is is really important. You know, it used to be, I think it still is, candidly, but it used to be there's like there's what sales does, and then there's what marketing does. 
And, you know, I think one thing that we've learned over the years is um, buyers are now more sophisticated than ever before. Uh, they're much more adept at digital that we were talking about. They do a lot more research before they even pick up the phone to talk to a rep or pop on a Zoom call to talk to a rep. And so the role of marketing has gone up a lot in, in importance. Uh, and one of the things that one of my colleagues did some research on is this concept of a day one list, which is um, as buyers, they're often building their list of uh, potential vendors that they're going to buy from before they even talk to a rep. And we call that the day one list. Sure. And, you know, about 80, 85 percent of buyers before they pick up the phone to talk to a rep have their day one list already created. Um, and there's something like three, four or five different vendors on it. No, no surprise. The interesting thing is 90% of the time they buy off of that day one list, regardless of who they talk to. Interesting. And so what that means is, while well, you may not have won the deal before uh, you speak to a buyer, you may have actually lost it. And so that increases the importance of marketing, getting out there, earning your position on the day one list. And of course, then the seller has to do a hard job of of earning the meeting and closing the deal. Um, but marketing it, it, it is really important. And that, and that I think has only accelerated going through COVID and, and so on and so forth. And so that's how you stay close to it, right? It's like, it's not just about the rep. It's about the whole group of folks who are going out there and engaging. With the customer. Yeah. And, and a lot of, a lot of folks refer to this as sort of the revenue team, right? Or the go to market revenue yeah. team. And it used to be, and it kind of still is. It's like, it's easy to make these excuses, right? It's like product marketing, product people, like that's the problem, but it's all really is one team. So I appreciate you highlighting that. And it actually really connects to the, you know, the third habit of top performance, which is they go well beyond the basic, you know, the people that are probably creating that day one list, but there's tons of other hidden allies and prospects at your customers. This is something I've been experimenting with in yeah. the last couple of years. It's like, you know, the decision makers are going to, DMs are going to come and go, right? You've got a you got a multi-thread, right? I'm sure you see this occurring with with uh, uh, with top reps. I would even contend that you know the B reps, that's what they need to be focused on is multi-threading, getting beyond the usual suspects, especially before the day one list, if possible. What a great chat, Jordan! I want to say thank you for joining the Deep Sales Podcast. We covered a lot of ground. This is um, awesome. I think I could talk to you forever about it. Um, we, we covered off on, um, you know, the sales playbook, how it's changed, generative AI, your perspective on sales and deep sales. Of course, want to thank you on behalf of LinkedIn and the deep sales podcast for joining. Rob, thanks for having me. It's super fun. Happy to do it anytime. Thank you for joining the deep sales podcast. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe and share. See you on our next episode or for more deep sales insights in the meantime, check out the LinkedIn sales blog. As always, happy selling.